Welcome back, Red Spotters. I'm your host today, Alexis Soto, joined by absolutely nobody. It is me again here on Red Spotlight, the place that brings you all of the latest stories coming out of the world of movies and more. And um, I'm a little bit upset this week because so much of the news items have been fucking depressing. As far as where the hell is everybody else? Well, Kyle went to go see Mario without me. So, yeah, not bitter about that at all. Um, Peter is AWOL, you know, studying to become a nurse because that apparently is important for whatever reason. Um, David and Alexis have fucked off to Japan um, with our only viewers in tow, so it's like, okay, well, literally, I'm the last one left standing. And so there is so much happening this week that is honestly kind of getting on my nerves couple of narratives forming and here we are right so what has happened this week there have been the announcements of new projects um there have been trailers and where do we begin with any of it well um that's kind of an interesting question there's a lot of star wars news breaking right now in real time uh there's an actual star wars show that's falling apart before our very eyes in real time um and I don't know, if there is a particular theme, is that so much devastation could have been avoided if there were only smarter individuals in charge in the, I don't know, the monolith that we call Hollywood, as if we would expect any kind of creative thinking or critical thinking, much less, to be involved in any of this process when you only have billions of dollars to spend, mind you. Um, You know, well, we live in a capitalist society, we live in a corporate mentality, which means oftentimes the smartest people in the room are nowhere near the process, and we're left with a bunch of grifters, or buffoons, or nepo babies, or whatever have you, that have been able to kind of like, you know, shiv their way to the top and make these decisions. And, you know, isn't that a theme? Bob Iger. (laughs) Well, you know, he is an individual who right now at this moment in time is trying to fleece the company off of many people who have been sucking the life out of it. Namely, of course, the first person um, that even, you know, allowed for Iger to be back in charge in the first place was Bob Chapek, you know, being assassinated. So there's that. And I mean, literally assassinated because like, where the hell has he been? Like, probably like putting a paper bag over his face because like, I mean, of course, how how could you go in public like that after again, after being so humiliated? Rightfully deserved, of course. No sympathy whatsoever. Um, but yeah, it's it's been a, term, a tumultuous time for Disney, as you know we have been saying for weeks on now, because literally all of their flagships are sinking at the same time. One example of this was the firing of Victoria Alonso, who, you know, there have been so many stories coming out about what exactly is the reason for why she was let go, but apparently it's all of them. And partly, this cannot, you, I, I'm sorry, you cannot ignore the timing of this particular high level firing comes off considering the disaster that is Ant Man and the Wasp Quantumania. For one, it made less money than the first Ant-Man movie did at the box office, which wasn't a lot, you know, to begin with. And then in a shift in strategy, and this you can probably tell um, the Avatar uh, premium video on demand sales were a big influencer in this, which only just barely went online. If you haven't seen, if you want to go ahead and purchase the film digitally, you can do that right now, but it must have made a lot of money for them. Of course, Avatar, The Way of Water being one of the highest grossing films of all time, of course, that shouldn't be really a surprise. But, you know, Disney usually has been employing the strategy of like dumping their movies immediately on premium video on demand and on, you know, Disney Plus, which, you know, I think has always been rather foolhardy. And I think they've kind of outed themselves as having made a big mistake because they're trying... Um, and they're clearly uh, seeing some good signs out of the Avatar sales that starting with Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, it is not going to drop on Disney Plus first. It's actually going to go on a uh, its own window, which is premium video on demand. Um, and they're actually, interestingly enough, promoting bonus features, which, you know, again, 
for anybody who has been paying attention for a long time here on this podcast, uh, there are many of us who are avid collectors, or were anyway, of physical media. And one of the selling points of physical media was the bonus features. But lately, those kind of features and the amount of resources being put to produce those features on discs have been dwindling because of what is the perceived and rather a real lack of interest in discs. But as we said a few weeks back, Iger himself is reevaluating a lot of the traditional um, release um, mediums for their films. And it seems like he is being sincere and rather serious about taking a real long look at you know, the viability of discs going forward. And for a press release to come out and promote bonus features, that is striking. That is not something that um, any of us would rather have expected this um, to be in the year 2023, when everyone obviously, for the most part, has moved on from discs. But if Disney is considering looking at discs and uh, promoting visual, I mean, premium video on demand, that is a sign that things are not going the right way and they need to make some easy money real fast, especially with, you know, uh, Disney Plus, they said, was going to pay for itself within a few years. We're at the five-year mark. It's not. It's actually a big hole. There's nothing but money being poured into it and it's not creating much of a return and it's not just a Disney issue. It is a streaming issue overall, which is why we're living in this kind of weird time where People, uh, the distributors are putting the brakes on how much money they spent on the streamers, which is rather interesting because um, most of the money I would assume that they've spent on these shows. Um, well, you know what? That's actually a wrong assumption because I would have assumed that The Mandalorian was the most expensive show that they actually made. But there are insiders who insist that in the early days of the Marvel Disney Plus shows, they would spend upwards of... Jesus, I don't even want to, I mean, 20, no, like around 30 or $40 million, like almost like a mini movie. Um, and for one, and in particular, the one that, that the show that they were talking about was the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. The money does not show at all. And that is just a stupid amount of money. And I don't mean like, oh, that's a lot of money. I mean, no, you are stupid for spending that amount of money on something as a TV show for streaming. So I think you're seeing a lot of economizing going on and a lot of reevaluating about how much money they put into these shows. And, you know, I mean, this should have been really obvious. I don't understand. Like all of a sudden it's occurring to them. Oh, we're not making any money off of this. Hmm. Yeah. They're kind of sweating it over there right now at Disney. So anyway, this whole Victoria Alonso situation, she, she uh, was the primary person in charge of the visual effects. And again, if you unless you were living under a rock, you would recall that most recently, um, which only then was like the culmination of many years of these stories coming out, um, you know, went through a scandal um, when they're the, the number one target of visual effects artists in the industry because Marvel is the number one abuser. They, and we've, this goes into the way that they make their movies, right? Which is they film on a blue or green screen. They have really no idea what the background is going to be because it hasn't been written into the script yet. And even when they come to some kind of decision, there'll always be like small or large full sale changes happening. And that's why they always film their scenes, you know, with the built into rotoscope, everything going on behind them and replace it with a new background, which oftentimes causes um, the movies themselves. And in particular, those scenes to look like crap because the artists do not have anywhere near enough time to make them look halfway decent. And Victoria Alonso, considering all the reports that have come out about her, um, seems to be the primary abuser. Although, what is rather mysterious to me, and I feel like this could speak to perhaps a cult-like mentality among the Marvel fans and some in the industry, that they just refuse to say a single negative thing about Kevin Feige, who is the president of the Marvel Studios company. He is the person who was above Victoria Alonso and so he is the person that allowed for this kind of behavior to happen and didn't seem to care that uh, many of the people who were employed by them were being abused in this right so um clearly he should be you know part of why 
um, this was such a miss in the first place. But again, it just goes, it speaks to how they make their movies, right? And so we we here at Red Spotlight do not feel that that's something that's going to change anytime soon, even, even though they fire her. I wouldn't hold my breath, right? Also, um, Ike Perlmutter, the disgusting, filthy individual known as Ike Perlmutter, has finally been vacated from the premises, which, you know, it's weird. Like, it, it was bad enough that he almost fired Kevin Feige at the peak of Marvel, mind you. It was bad enough that he had no faith in women and black people selling movies that he, you know, for the longest time prevented Captain Marvel and Black Panther from even being made or considered in the first place. Um... It's not bad enough that he's a racist and a sexist and a you know a Trump ally. He's a very close friend to Donald Trump, of course. Um, but what really set things off was the idea that he was trying to play a game of brinksmanship and um, mess things up for Bob Iger as far as the board is concerned. You know, right now, I believe Ike Perlmutter was propping up an individual who was going to run a proxy campaign against Bob Iger to make a, a bid for uh, the seat, um, making a personal appeal to the Board of Supervisors. Um, Iger um, successfully swathed his way into, you know, talking that down, and that challenger or presumptive challenger ended up withdrawing. Um, but you no, know, Iger didn't forget that and was like, um, you know, handing out a bunch of pink slips and, um, Bob, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Ike Perlmutter has been fired. Finally, uh, somebody who should have been, you know, asked to leave a long time ago at this point. Um, and speaking of Disney, they're in an interesting point right now where they're kind of like, um, I don't know. They have a lot to lose and they're losing a lot right now. Um, there's just not much traction going on. Even this Little Mermaid, I know they announced some projects that we're going to get into right now, but like this Little Mermaid um, campaign, I don't know if it's just me here, but it does not appear to be going over very well, and I am not sensing much excitement out of this. Because I think mainly because it doesn't look good at all. It looks kind of like crap if you're being honest with ourselves here. But, you know, there's always the chance that it could. It's going to be successful no matter what. But I think the, the real um, barometer is going to be is how close, if at all, it gets to a billion dollars. That's always been the metric of success for these movies. Um, But here's the thing. Uh, they announced another live action remake this time on Moana Moana of course the Disney animated film that was released in 2016 <sighs> I am literally so angry talking about this because for one the idea of it, as we've like talked to death for so many years in this podcast, is so repulsive to me. It's even more... Um, what's the right word here? It's even more gross to me that it's... That they're using The Rock to launch this. Which, of course... I mean, look. How pathetic and embarrassing can you be, Dwayne? Honestly. Like, you had a big L with Black Adam... He had the studio literally like stab you in the back and rightfully so considering how your creative decisions like stronghold them into them taking an L all over the place with Black Adam and Shazam. Like you personally kind of sunk the viability of two franchises and you don't think the studio has any right in, in fighting back to what you did? Anyway, and by the way, I, I'm not saying this as if he had any malicious intent. No, he was just being a diva idiot that caused this to happen. Just to be clear about that. And so what does he do? He goes back to his playbook to make something safe, vanilla, and boring. And a live-action remake, honestly, would be grateful to have those qualities. Usually those films are just downright terrible. The live-action Disney films, based off animated movies of their, you know, their prized animated films, in my view, 
have had a reputation that are, you know, I think, quite prestigious, you know. They're among the worst films ever made. They're among the worst films I've ever seen. And they're among the, the, the films that people talk about the, the least. And I think we can all kind of, like, see as to why, you know, it, they are all those things and more. But him just like putting himself again face forward as like his particular his personal project is even only more enraging to me. And I really do hope this fails and I hope he fails because um, look, Moana is very popular and I love the film. It is an amazing film and you can see how popular it is if you look at the Nielsen streaming numbers. On Disney Plus, it's one of the most viewed films consistently. That isn't the problem here. The problem is, when is enough enough? Where is the fucking line? And are you ever going to stop crossing it? Because when you put this against DreamWorks announcing a live action adaptation of How to Train Your Dragon, what hell is about to be shelled on us for the next few years where now we're going to mine the popular animated franchise of the 2010s which was just the previous decade it used to be before there was this idea that there was you know enough time that had elapsed that we're ready to come back and revisit some of these stories well, that mentality has clearly been thrown out the window. Because, like, what the fuck is next? The Frozen remake on, in live action? Zootopia? Hilariously enough, how you know what? They're animals. Of course. Oh, yeah, of course you're going to go ahead and do that. The Wreck-It Ralph live action remake? The Big Hero 6 live action? Like, when are we going to stop? Even Peter joked. Oh, you know, he wasn't actually joking that. It was actually pretty serious. I'm surprised they haven't announced the Toy Story live action remake at this point. Like... This needs to be put away. And I feel like Disney is severely underestimating the lack of appetite there is for that. Because, you know, oftentimes people do not speak in a rather clear um, approach as to, you know, the different eras that we're in. Think back to the 20th century. Not that we were alive, but just think about how different each decade of that century was. Do you think we're going to be any different than that? We're already seeing it with Marvel taking a downturn, not just because there have been clear deficiencies in quality on a number of different areas, but because they already reached their peak. They're never going to have that again. And what's happening to them is what happens to everybody. Time. Time beats everyone. And fashions go in and they go out. People are on top and then they're on rock bottom. It is just the natural progression of time. There is no evading that. Disney as a whole was at its peak. They were at the top of the mountain peak, literally speaking, in the 2010s. They had six, respectively, billion, uh, do billion dollar grossing films in 2019 alone. Do you honestly think, does anyone honestly think they're ever going to reach that again? No. And if they do, it won't be for a long time. Why? Because everything on this planet changes every 10 years. And sometimes, you know, when you think back to the very different decades that made up the 20th century, you know, there are decades like perhaps the 50s and 60s where there are more similarities and there are differences. Or maybe even the 30s and the 40s when there are more similarities and differences. But you get to decades like the well, there's a lot of difference in the 60s and the 70s, the 70s and the 80s, and the 80s and the 90s, and even more so from the 90s to the 2000s. It is just what's going to happen, right? And so what I am speaking to is, for as long as general audiences have withstood a lot of the generic crap, quite frankly, that not just Disney, but most studios have been releasing this last you know, decade, I feel like we are seeing signs that there is a paradigm shift occurring. What does that mean? It means that not wholesale, not holistically, but maybe in some areas here and there, the overall taste, 
the overall kind of ideal movie that audiences are willing to go spend money on in a theater is maybe not changing, but shifting. And they are being interestingly selective to projects that they wouldn't in in the in the previous decade would not have even considered being selective. They would have just gone and go see it because it was part of you know the genre that was hot. Why are there a lot of people talking about you know the future viability in comic book films? Well, the first thing is, well, the real reason is because they're not making as much money anymore. When you have you know between Black Adam, Ant Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania, and Shazam: Fury of the Gods. Which, by the way, I, f- I feel terrible lumping in Shazam with Black Adam and Quantumania because, quite frankly, Quantumania and Black Adam are among the worst comic book films I've ever seen. Shazam is one of the very best in the last 10 years, and I will go to the grave fighting that. But all three of them failed, and they failed hard at the box office, like you haven't seen in a long time. And it is rather striking when... This is a genre that, for the most part anyway, was so financially successful that the movie would just pay for itself and it would be released. Now, things have changed. Even um, the films from Marvel that are headlining characters like Black Panther and Thor and Doctor Strange, all of those movies last year did not even make it to a billion dollars. Uh Uh-oh, something's changing here. We're seeing something, and I feel like it's only become more apparent with the almost immediate failures of Ant-Man and Shazam. And they were both released within the span of a month. They were both back-to-back. And why? Well, because a lot of them have been crap. A lot of them have been the same. A lot of them have been bad in the same ways. And even though... And I know this is going to sound rather dismissive and condescending, and I don't care because they're going to act this way no matter what. But, you know, the general audience, I fundamentally believe, are incapable of articulating the reasons for why they don't like this, they don't like a particular genre or a movie, they just don't. They know they don't like it, or they they don't like it anymore, or they don't like it as much as they used to, but don't even ask, bother asking them, like, why? They're not going to answer you. I mean, not in a, in a helpful way. So you have to kind of gauge for yourself, like, what's going on here? They've all been underwhelming. They've all been, you know, boring, generic, standard, run of the mill. And we've had so many of those in the t- 2010s. Like, I feel we're on the precipice of passable to okay, even. I mean, it would be one thing if we had passable or okay films. But we've had a couple of duds in a row. And I feel like the word of mouth is going to spread around. And it might not even matter because the interest already seems to be down. You're already seeing the lack of interest happening in real time because of how bad some of the most recent ones have been. Right now, comic book fans and Marvel fans, they really are kind of like, they're grasping at straws to find the reasons for why they're no longer as enchanted with the Marvel films as they used to be. When they're missing, um, they're missing, uh, was it the forest for the trees? Probably. I'm not sure that's the right expression here, but they're missing the point. It's not, you know, because, oh, they're using dead characters or they're using new characters or they don't have a plan or they feel disconnected. I think ultimately the real reason is the the films themselves have not been good. They've been repetitive. They've been generic. And they've been meandering. And they've been rather low in stakes because there's just no ambition to be higher in stakes. Where does it all come back to, Kevin Feige? It all comes back to this mentality that the films that, that they make can only be made in a certain way. And even, I believe, Victoria Alonso, in, um, it was, I think, I don't know if it was leaked or if it was reported that she had said, no, actually, and this was actually, I, I have I have reason to suspect this was Chloe Zhao, the director of The Eternals, um, and of course, the best picture winning Nomadland. But, because um, the article, uh, you know, kept the director anonymous, but they referred to her as her, 
And there have only ever been two female directors for Marvel films. It was either going to be Kate Shortland that did Black Widow or Chloe Zhao that did Eternals. I have reason to suspect it was Chloe Zhao because I would think that she got into a lot of disagreements. And I don't think Victoria Alonso was very happy with how Eternals was made because, you know, Victoria Alonso was very much the face for what you think are the worst tendencies in uh, the visual effects standpoint in Marvel films. And while Eternals, they didn't abide to that at all. They actually went outside and they shot and they shot things interestingly. And, you know, not for nothing, Chloe Zhao made those visual effects uh, people work. Particularly the executives and the supervisors that usually work on every Marvel film. No, she did not take their standard stuff. She made them do things and animate the shots in ways that I think, you know, clearly show in the film itself that you don't see in any of the other Marvel films. But um, again, I don't want to say for sure it's Chloe Zhao, but I have reason to suspect that it is Chloe Zhao that said this. But she was saying that um, at one point, Victoria Alonso said to her or, you know, or it got back to her that Victoria Alonso said something to the effect that, you know, the directors do not make the movies. We make the movies. Now, isn't that just like point blank an admission for everything we have been saying about them for years at this point? What more proof are you going to need? So, yeah, if they refuse to change the way they make movies, fuck them. They deserve what's coming to them. And you know what's going to be rather interesting is the upcoming Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, which, Jesus, fuck, that movie looks amazing. And everything about that film and the marketing, it's, it honestly points to a truly special film. <laughs> and you honestly, take all of this that I've been telling you and compare that to the way that James Gunn has been talking about his movie. You know, he talks about his films not in a, in, in a, from a standpoint of like, what is it going to do for the universe that it exists in? You know? No, of course he doesn't do that. He talks about his films in the context of, um, you know, what is it actually going to mean for the characters that he's using? What is it going to mean for their overall themes of the trilogy that he has made? You know? I'm actually going to go ahead and, and put him on right now because the way that he speaks about um, his films um, is basically everything you don't, hear anyone at Marvel do. And this is also exa exactly why directors are so important for their projects and why especially they're so important for superhero films. You need director-driven creatives in charge because if you just have the same executives doing every movie, you end up in a place where we are right now. When they all look the same, they all look bad, and no one cares anymore. I think of volume one as being about the mother, volume two is about the father, and volume three is about the self. And coming to terms with each of those situations, in the first one, Peter Quill is coming to terms with his relationship with his mother, which is the person he loved the most in the world. In volume two, he's coming to terms with his relationship with his father. The one he thought he wanted wasn't the one he wanted, and the one he had was better than what he thought he was. And then in the third one, it's about getting to accept yourself. Who are we really and how are we okay? You know, Mantis even says is at one time in the in the movie, most of them don't like themselves very much. They all have issues with themselves. Nebula has issues with herself. Peter Quill has issues with himself. Mantis, they Craglin, they all do. And um and and Rocket most of all. So I think that that's what this this movie is about above and beyond anything else. Yeah, that sounds like what I would want every movie regardless of what genre it exists in, to be. That's what I w would want every movie to be. Um, I, I don't think I'm ready, guys. Like, I, I, I feel like I've kind of been ignoring the, the existence of this film for a long time, but I, if anything, this may be the last great film that comes out of Marvel Studios. And if anything, this is where a lot of people should just jump ship because 
there is just something in the air about this movie that is making me think, fuck, he made something truly magnificent here. And why wouldn't he? Again, he's James fucking Gunn. When was the last time he missed? He's coming off of Peacemaker, the Suicide I mean, Suicide Squad, and of course, two Guardians films that are beloved. I don't see why this would be in any doubt, and I am really curious to see what a lot of his haters are going to say once the film comes out, and it's great. And that is um, coming up pretty close for us, so... It'll be nice. It'll be around the time of my, of my birthday, so it'd be nice to go see that film. Oh, man. These characters have been with us for almost 10 years now. It's crazy to think about. And um, it's going to be an emotional movie, that's for sure. Speaking of emotion, look, I know it's a running gag here that I don't see certain trailers. I'm sorry, like... For whatever reason, unless I I know the person involved or if I have already a, I don't know, a connection to something in it, I, I'm not going to see a trailer until I see it in the theater. I'm just not. Well, unless I'm made to. But um, sometimes I do go out of my way to go see trailers. When it dropped at midnight, I didn't even hesitate. The trailer for Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. The best film of 2018, by the way. Wow. Everything. Just about everything missing from comic book movies today. Even more so than Shazam. Because Shazam actually proved that they had a lot of the things that most films were missing, but to an even far grander scale. Across the Spider-Verse, quite honestly, immediately looks like one of the best comic book films ever made. The animate the quality of the animation is breathtaking. The quality in what you're already feeling the feels that are coming out of the characters in the story. Man, dude, it is gonna be a great year. Um when it comes, when, when we have Across the Spider-Verse and Guardian Street coming out, because, and you know what? What would be great in this year is that we are going to see a range of quality in comic book films. I have no doubt that by the time we come to the end, I haven't seen these movies, but it, you know, again, if you know the no, if you know who's involved, you come to have a reasonable expectation for how certain films are going to shape up. You just do. I have no doubt that Spider-Verse and Guardians are going to be the best comic book films of the year by a wide mile. And think about the chasm of quality that is going to exist between those two films I just mentioned and then things like Quantum Mania. It is going to be like a day and night situation. Um, and I'm hoping it's going to wake more people up, you know, and to see like, well, you know, that they do deserve better. I do think there is a lot to be said for audiences looking around at other projects that are of a far superior quality. Like, look at the Star Wars situation. Look at Andor. Look how great that is. And then just like how abysmal everything else around it is. So... They need to start, the, these people who, like for Marvel or Star Wars, they have to start thinking that they, they ain't shit, really, at the end of the, of the day. Like, it's like that old song goes, um, but instead of hoes, it'll be like, Marvel ain't shit, but, wait, no, what was it? <laughs> Bitches ain't shit, but hoes and tricks, that's the song, sorry. Well, I just aged myself. Bitches ain't shit, but hoes and tricks, but Marvel ain't shit but hoes and tricks literally that's all they are and until they i don't know wake up to that fact what i mean why would anybody expect the marvels or captain america or i mean which is it really even a captain america when it's just full of hulks 
What a fucking disaster. I even heard a rumor that somehow they're going to weave in some X-Men connections into the Captain America movie. <laughs> Which is like, okay, okay, you're really not listening. Right? Okay, go fuck yourself. Anyway, that is so unbelievably offensive to Anthony Mackie. Just like, he, he can't be allowed to have his own movie. That's just, that's great. Um. Anywho, talking about embarrassing situations, can we look at what's happening with The Mandalorian? I have to say, um, I've been watching this season just out of curiosity. I'm literally just watching the show to see how bad it gets. You know? I will say, this most recent episode, I didn't hate because I was laughing so hard at these... <laughs> Look, I was laughing. No, when I no, guys, I'm being serious. So picture, if you will, I'm watching The Mandalorian this past week in my room, and on my screen I see Jack Black, and who doesn't love Jack Black? No disrespect to him. I'm not. I'm not even referencing him for the reason for why I cackled. But it took me um, a, a a minute to register that who I was looking at was Lizzo. And I, I was laughing so hard. Do you ever see that that old clip of, um, I say old, but it's like a few years ago at this point, Raven Simone was doing this live stream and she, get a, she got a comment and she was like laughing really hard. Like it, it almost sounded like an evil laugh a little bit, but she was laughing so hard. And then she was also eating some food, which also made it funnier. That's exactly how I was when I realized that was fucking Lizzo. Like, I just couldn't believe <laughs> the audacity they had to just go. And by the way, I love Lizzo. She's great. I, I have nothing against her. But it's like, it, I think it just goes to show you the mentality behind the scenes, the people who make this, that um, they, they feel so bulletproof that they feel that they're above um, certain decisions that are going to make them look rather... Um, make them look like a joke because well I would say maybe even more so than Lizzo being in the picture all the scenes involving her and Jack Black they're so obviously Lizzo and Jack Black that you just can't help but being taken out of it like I was and you know what I'm not mad about that because I don't like this show <laughs> so being taken out of it and having a good laugh for a change is an, a nice change of pace but the whole thing, and again, the, the, the cheapness, and I don't even know if it's a choice. I just think they're literally hiring incompetent individuals across the board, Disney is, between Marvel and Star Wars. But there is something to be said for the fact that most of their projects, when they have, especially when you have celebrities like this, you just can't help but think SNL, you know? Saturday Night Live, when, when you watch this, like... There was a, a scene where Lizzo is like playing some kind of golf Quidditch thing and the Baby Yoda thing just like uses the force to help her. And then at the end of the day, when that episode's through, she, I, I'm not even kidding you, she does a knighting ceremony for the Baby Yoda. I mean, I don't even know what you can say to something like that. Um, but, I mean, it, it felt like a old school Clone Wars episode, but it does make you realize, though, that there are things that definitely work in animation that do not work in live action, that's for sure. Um, now, I feel like the, peop the thing that most people are glaring over and what I personally do feel to be the most incompetent thing that was featured was the idea that um, Bo-Katan has the dark saber back Mando handed it to her because in front of other Mandalorians he was like well she rescued me after I got beat by this other guy and she beat that guy so according to the rules you know, I got to bring out the rule book. It's hers, right, guys? 
John Favreau. And you know what? I am really happy that a lot of people are finally waking up because the level of writing that we're at is abysmal. We're not even at bad here. We're just at abysmal. John Favreau, he, he needs to feel really embarrassed right now because more than just the emptiness and the vapidness and the lack of stakes and ambition, he himself cannot even fully commit to the things that he previously set himself for. Like, even though I hated the idea of a confrontation between Mando and Bo-Katan because I happen to like Bo-Katan, not on this show, but just generally speaking, I like Bo-Katan and did not want her to seem like a villain. That at least would have been interesting, but you know what? There was the red flag, guys. There was the red flag. Why would Jon Favreau do anything that was interesting? Why would he? Like, talk about pathetic. Absolutely pathetic. You cannot even commit to the things that you yourself set forth. Anyway, on whole, uh, the Mandalorian, uh, according to analytics that have been released, um, the ratings for the show overall as a season are down a full 25% from season two. So yeah, that should tell you. Also, there's a Harry Potter reboot happening. I don't know if anybody cares. I don't care. I mean, I don't like Harry Potter, really. I mean, it. I say I don't like is I'm not passionate about it. I, I like the films just fine. Um, but I certainly I would never care to see a reboot. And I think, again, WB needs to understand that when it comes to that property, I, I mean, it seems like they do understand, but they've just kind of like, they're going to roll the dice anyway, because JK Rowling is not going to detach herself from that franchise ever, but her toxicity is bringing things down. And it's going to bring down the excitement for fans, of course, if she is involved in the process. And she is. If it's a, if it's a Wizarding World project, she's going to be involved. And until they separate themselves from her, why, would, why should any of us care? WB, working with J.K. Rowling, very much um, gives off, uh, we're endorsing her transphobic shit energy. Okay. Well, again, I think most general audiences are rather ignorant to the fact that that's a thing that's going on. And so that's not going to mean much. Um, not that most of them would care, quite frankly. I mean, we, we are a very transphobic society. But, uh, and again, not that it would matter in the box office, but as far as fans are concerned, Harry Potter fans are quite liberal. Mm, if you've not seen how vicious it's gotten in the fan circles with fans and J.K. Rowling, then uh, that's not, I'll, I'll put it this way. It's not helping <laughs> their projects. That doesn't help them at all. So there is that. Um, Mario, I feel like stabbing somebody right now because I feel like I've been right about Illumination Animation for such a long time now, and I let myself be tricked by them in their trailers and in the marketing because it actually seemed quite good. The animation quality was qu quite superb and, you know, I'm sure it's a fun movie. And I know Kyle saw it and he liked it. And I, um, I can't speak to the film. Maybe I'll feel differently or, or I'll feel like he did when I see the film at some point. But, um, The reviews have come out and they've rather spoken to a lack of story. And doesn't that just kind of speak to the way Illumination just makes their film sometimes? I, I, I don't understand why Universal would let this happen when they have DreamWorks animation, which by the way, DreamWorks right now should feel very good about themselves because even though they lost out on making this movie, they have just produced one of the biggest hits Universal has had in recent years with Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. There's no excuse for the film being okay 
when so many people are going to go and see it. This is such a big fandom. They were owed a great film. No one is calling this a great film. Saying, I liked it, is not saying, it's a great movie. And this is what this should have been. So, no, I am not, um, I'm sorry, I'm just not in the mood to be charitable uh, to those kind of people. Uh, especially when it was all just so um, preventable, mind you. Uh, it wasn't as if this came as a surprise, um, you know, in retrospect. I just got mad. When I saw the reactions, I just got mad at myself. Like, why did you let yourself be talked into thinking this is going to be anything good? Okay. So, Star Wars, the Ahsoka trailer is out. If there's a nice thing I can say about the Ahsoka trailer is, I, I, I and I'm hoping this is true, I did look into um, a Google search to see if John Favreau is involved, and he's not as far as writing is concerned. And if that's true, maybe, this is a big if, but maybe this has a chance of being halfway decent. And mind you, I'm being charitable only because I, unlike others, who will stop to no ends to re you know repeat how much they don't care about these characters, I care about these characters a lot. And one of the reasons why Jon Favreau is one of my many targets these days is because he robbed all of us of what this originally should have been. And the way that they make their live action projects and, and over there, I, I don't have much faith, especially for like, when, when you take a, the Mandalorian and Boba Fett particularly, when you look at those scripts, and this is the caliber that you're working with. Now granted, most of that was Favreau. I don't know how much of it was Filoni, but Filoni right now, you know what? He is going to be given his time right now to prove himself. And I'm hoping John Favreau leaves him alone. That way we can finally gauge for ourselves how strong of a creative and writer he is, for real. Because, you know, for people like Alexis and I, and Kyle, we've kind of been bewildered because we were big fans of the Clone Wars animated series and there was some strong writing going on, and Rebels as well. There was strong writing going on in both of those shows. Where that has been in The Mandalorian? I don't know. The culprit here seems to be Favreau. So he is going to be given his chance, finally, between his Ahsoka show and a movie that he was just given today as of the, uh, as of the date of this recording. Um, to prove himself. How good is he or not? So let me go ahead and read this from Variety because I myself am not too knowledgeable. This is all breaking stuff. Dave Filoni and James Mangold are set to direct two new Star Wars films. By the way, while these are people that Kathleen... It's funny, you know, I'll say this. These are people that Kathleen Kennedy has already worked with, so I'm thinking we can have some sense of security that these movies are going to actually be made. Because, look, if... Which actually would make, would make me nervous for some other projects. If these were people that Kathleen didn't work with before, I wouldn't hold my breath. But maybe they will actually be made, considering that, you know, Mangold... Did recently do uh, did the Dial of Destiny film, the Indiana Jones movie, which I'm also very hyped for. Um, so back to the article, the directors will helm two separate films in the franchise. Meanwhile, a third movie that centers on Ridley's um, Daisy Ridley's Ray will be directed by Emmy and Oscar-winning helmer Shereem Abed Chinoy. Lucasfilm president Kathleen Kennedy made the shock announcement at the studio's showcase during London's Star Wars celebration, where fans were expecting the announcement of a single film and were pleasantly surprised by a trifecta of projects. Mangold's movie will go back to the dawn of the Jedi, while Filoni's project will focus on the New Republic and close out, in quotation marks, 
The interconnected stories that are told in series, including The Mandalorian, The Book of Boba Fett, Ahsoka, and other Disney Plus shows. Um, give me one second here, guys. Um, so what Peter said, again, I haven't interacted much with him today in the chat, but he basically alluded to um, Filoni's project being an endgame of sorts, and that's what um, it's looking like it's going to be. Back to the article here. It's a chance to tell the entire story of its own. The birth of the Force, Mangled told Variety after the panel. When I first talked to Kathy Kennedy about it, I just said, I just see this opening to make this kind of a Ben-Hur or the Ten Commandments about the birth of the Force. The Force has become a kind of religious legend that spans through all these movies. But where did it come from? How is it found? Who found it? Who was the first Jedi? And that's what I'm writing right now. Mangold most recently directed Logan and this summer's Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, while Filoni is best known as the showrunner for The Mandalorian and Ahsoka. I take issue with this variety. Mm -mm. No, he is best known for his work on The Clone Wars and Rebels. Thank you very much both of which are Disney Plus series. Mangold is also writing the DC Comics adaptation Swamp Thing for Warner Brothers, with an eye to direct it. Let's see here. After the panel, Variety asked Filoni what was the singular thread weaving the varied stories together. On a base level, I would just say the coming conflict, the growing idea that the Empire wasn't as defeated as a lot of people want to believe, and that the remnant is out there, Filoni said. We saw that from the very beginning with the Mandalorian and how Giancarlo Esposito's character Gideon was plotting. There are always people that are willing to undermine something that the Republic is trying to rebuild or trying to build and put back on its feet. I grew up with a lot of stories in the expanding universe that were exploring what happened after Return of the Jedi. There has been this for fans... There has been this, for fans, idea that there was a new Republic and a new Remnant Empire, and the conflict persisted after Return of the Jedi. Even though the heroes won and were more in control, what did that control look like? And since Force Awakens is 30 years on out from Return of the Jedi, we have room then to tell another story. That's what I'm coalescing into this time period. Obed Chinoy's film will be set after the events of 2019's Rise of Skywalker and will feature Rey as she builds a new Jedi Order. Peaky Blinders and Spencer writer Stephen Ood will write, will pen the script. Now this sounds exciting. Spencer is an amazing movie starring Kristen Stewart. If you haven't seen that, what are you doing? Go and see it. The project, which is still untitled, marks several major milestones for the franchise. Obey Chinoy is the first woman and the first person of color to direct a Star Wars movie. The Pakistani filmmaker won two Academy Awards for the documentary short in 2011 for Saving Face and in 2015 for A Girl in the River, The Prize of Forgiveness. And she most recently directed two episodes of Miss Marvel for Disney+. Plus. Star Wars Celebration has so far yielded a number of announcements and new footage. Trailers were unveiled for the keenly anticipated Ahsoka, which launches in August. Damn, I forgot about that. As well as The Acolyte, a new thriller series starring Amanda Stanberg and Squid Game star Lee Jung Jae. Andor also shared some new footage from Season 2, Oh no, which will premiere in August of 2024. That is so far away. Ay, ay, ay. Anyway, that's that. Mm. Any lingering observations there? I am hopeful, mostly I'm hopeful for the Ray stuff because that's a character that sorely needs redemption for... Look, I want to say in large part, the Star Wars fans let her down. 
They've been rather cruel and disgusting towards her. So she needs a win there. But also, J.J. Abrams let her down. And let her down hard. And isn't it amazing how he has not made anything since that fiasco in 2019? So at the end of the day, if this results in, well, first of all, better movies, but a better standing for that character, please, 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 please let this be good. Um, curiously enough, nothing has been made about Obi-Wan. Now, I'm not one of these people who's like, frothing at the mouth for more of it I, I, I wouldn't mind but I guess the thing is they did tease something with him and Qui-Gon Jinn and if anything if anything wouldn't that just make for at the very least a project not and I don't mean like a project of course it's gonna mean a project but like I mean a movie considering that the the talk of the town is that show should have been a movie. So surprising to see that that's not um, one of the announcements, unless it's still in development there, um, considering how popular Ewan McGregor still is playing that character, you know? So, really interesting stuff there when it comes to Star Wars. We'll see if they, we'll see, right? We'll see if they're able to turn it around, but, um, It's going to be a work in progress for sure, guys. Um, it's not going to come all at once. And we're just going to have to see for ourselves how this is all going to end up shaping up. But yeah, that's kind of the lay of the land that we're in right now. Um, I've actually been re-familiarizing myself with the Pokemon world, as a matter of fact. And honestly, I really forgot how entertaining some of those um, episodes can be from a just pure comedic standpoint. Um, now, don't take it into your head thinking that, oh, I'm watching every single episode. Fuck that. There are like a thousand episodes. I'm just picking... A few from, you know, one season and a few from another season. I actually just finished uh, re-watching the Battle Frontier season, which, if you don't recall, was rather um, tumultuous and controversial because it replaced the voice actors. And you know what? Since we did speak to this previously a few weeks ago when David... Well, actually, no, the last episode when David and I discussed Pokemon, uh, we did talk about this dramatic... Um, change that happened with the voice actors. So, I'm actually going to play this clip here from one of the uh, people that did, uh, I think, the, the most full account of what went on behind the scenes. Now, keep in mind, this was tra the transition from Advanced Battle to Battle Frontier, the final season of the Advanced Generation, which happened 2005, 2006, I want to say. 2006, Pokemon USA decided to switch the Pokemon anime's dubbing studio. Rather than paying four kids to dub the anime into English, Pokemon USA decided to do it themselves. And when this happened, they completely recast the show. Not a single main cast member got to keep their role. And that includes Veronica Taylor, voice of Ash. After eight years and 417 episodes as Ash, Veronica Taylor was made to step down from her role. Okay, so let's dig a little deeper. What actually happened here? Well, it seems like different people were told different things. According to Eric Stewart, original voice of Brock and James, Pokemon USA switched studios as a cost-cutting measure. He wrote, Pokemon USA has decided that it's too expensive to use four kids and the actors that have made Pokemon the TV show such a success for the last 10 years. They have, behind our backs, recast the show with sound alikes to try and save money. Maddie Blaustein, voice of Meowth, explained, 
The reason that Pokemon USA isn't using four kids is about a ridiculously low sum of money that Pokemon USA refused to budge on. Instead, they are using cheap studios, cheap voice talent, cheap engineers, cheap everything. Veronica Taylor made a statement too, although it was perhaps a little more reserved. We have been informed that Pokemon USA has already made plans to do the anniversary special with substitute voices. Apparently, they haven't made a firm decision on the next season yet. None of us have formally been asked to do the show. We've simply been told we'll be replaced. So it seems the original cast members were told very little, only that they were being replaced by a new cast and that they couldn't come back for the next season, perhaps as a cost-saving measure. Yikes. <sighs> The new cast, though, the ones taking over, were given different information. They were told that the original voice contracts with four kids prevented them from dubbing Pokemon with a different studio. According to Bill Rogers, the new voice of Brock, unfortunately, due to the contracts that these actors have signed with four kids, they are no longer able to work on Pokemon. Pokemon USA themselves made a similar statement. We changed the voice actors for the main characters because we were told that the actors who used to provide voices to our characters had conflicting contractual commitments. So there we go, it was a contract issue. Well, maybe, but Veronica Taylor said this. Pokemon USA has made no effort to negotiate with four kids, simply feeling that getting a cheaper rate to dub the show is enough. And if that's not clear enough, Rachel Lillis, voice of Misty and Jesse, wrote this. The contract did not present unimpeachable terms whatsoever. We could very well have continued with the show. That is, if we knew what was going on in the first place. We didn't know the licensing contract was ending. We didn't know they were considering sound alikes. No job offers were made. In fact, the producer at 4Kids had been sent the materials for the next season and was awaiting further correspondence. There was no indication anything out of the ordinary was going on until the decision had already been made. That is pretty unambiguous. Um, you know, I have to say, uh, I have been looking at some older comments online at the time, and it, it really just it brought me back, man, to that time period and what an adjustment period it was. You know, it was you have to keep in mind that a lot of people, I think, just stopped watching it because of this alone. Like these people who had been with the show from the very beginning, they, they were the voices of these characters and they were stabbed in the back. They were stabbed in the face. And um, it didn't couple well with the fact that the new voices took some time adjusting to. At the time of this recording, um, I had already like finished watching the selection of episodes for that season. And I will say that um, it takes time to get used to. And in retrospect, if they were to do it all over again, they should have maybe waited for um, the Battle Frontier season. It would have been nice if that was the final season. If if it, if it had to be that four kids would no longer be involved, for whatever reasons, um, the Pokemon company had no interest in doing it, then that, the Battle Frontier should have been their last season because it ultimately ended up being the culmination of... It felt, anyway like the end of the first iteration of the show with then diamond and pearl being the whole new world um situation as the show often delves into um but yeah it is an adjustment period and i would even say that when it came to the following season season 10 there was a tremendous amount of improvement from the quality of the voice work but i will say it's not just the voice work itself what I would say also took just a bit of a nosedive in the ninth season. Look, the quality of the episodes themselves, and again, this the story comes from you know the Japanese team, so they greatly dictate the direction the show goes into. Um, now that part comes from them. A lot of the battles themselves and a lot of the character arcs were rather great, honestly. Um, but Again, how do you translate that in, in the dubbing production? Also, you know, they make script changes. They make, obviously, dialogue changes. What did 
take a noticeable nosedive was the quality in the script writing, the quality in the dialogue. There are a lot of moments in that season where you're like, that was a weird thing to say. Or maybe that wasn't a weird a weird thing to say, but it was a weird thing to say in that moment when you're making that face. Or like, what? Like, yeah, there, there are a couple of things here. Um, and it was hilarious. I did not, I did not know this, but I don't know if they were paying royalties, but even though it wasn't the four kids team doing the show any longer, they were legit using their background music like every episode. And I have to wonder, did they end up purchasing the rights for that music or what happened? But it was just like, and then there was even, there was a rendition of a particular theme that would play um, during the climax of certain episodes that it sounded close to what it would be in the four kids iteration, but it wasn't quite there. It actually sounded a little cheaper, <laughs> you know, as if it like, Hmm, they definitely didn't have as many people in the room when they were recording this rendition of this particular music piece. So yeah. Um, also, and I don't know, maybe the quality of the, of the animation, not to, the same degree as the voice acting or the or the music itself, but there's something about the anim the look of the animation that season where it looks just a little bit too bright. I don't know what accounts for that, but I don't know. Whenever I get talking with David, I'm gonna ask him to to look over some of those episodes and 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 get his thoughts because I'm sure he hasn't seen that in like ages. But these are just like things that I've picked up on. Um when it comes to that particular time in the series. But also just how awful it was, right? To have that ripped away from you. If you're people like Veronica Taylor or all the other voice actors. So, appreciate what you have in life, people, because you never know when one day it'll just be gone. Anyway, that's a rather depressing note to, to end things on, but I've got nothing else to say. Thank you so much for listening. We will see you here next time on Red Spotlight, anywhere you listen to podcasts every single Sunday. Stay under our spotlight for more content, and we will see you. Bye-bye.